we'll, uh, we'll start what will probably be the most bizarre panel that you will experience at, at the event this year. Um, I'm Saurabh Katari from Cisco, and I'll quickly introduce uh, the, the three other speakers, not that they'll wait for me to do that. Um, and a couple of things that we're going to do a little differently. I'm actually going to have them do their longer introduction about what they do as a job just before we go to Q&A, because if we do it now, you're going to forget. So we'll do it just before we go to Q&A. Secondarily, during Q&A, I will actually be down on the floor with you. I will be chasing the questions with the mic. And if you don't ask questions, I will be presenting the mic to you to ask a question. Okay, this is a very interactive second half. The first half, we will be taking five minutes with each of the gentlemen, and we're timing it, five minutes only, for each of them to present on their areas. Um, and so I'd like to start by polling the audience, the uh, 40 or so of you, 40, 45 of you, when I just counted. How many people here work for a brand? Okay. How many people work for an agency? Apparently the agency folks are very shy. I saw one slight hand. Um, and how many people here work for a technology or video platform? Interesting. And who are the rest of you then? <laughs> what, what do you do? Um, okay, well good, we have a good mix and what we were expecting. Uh, I'm just gonna give a quick introduction as to how this panel was put together. Um, we thought that, you know, the biggest insult that most of us experience in our professional lives is when people waste our time. That's pretty much the best way to insult somebody at work, just waste their time. And all of us working at large companies have at some point in our careers directed our video or webcasting vendor down a path that three to five years later was a waste of everyone's time. So that was sort of the, the idea behind this panel of why don't we just give some really candid feedback about what major corporations care about when it comes to video platforms, video streaming, and webcasting, and just give you really direct input, also looking at where we're going, so that hopefully it helps you waste less of your time if you're developing for this audience, or if you're partnering with this audience. So on that note, I'm going to shut up now, and I'm going to hand it over to our first speaker, um, Dave Ross from EMC. Thank you, Sorb. Hello. Does that mean you're out of here? Mic drop? I should sure drop the mic. Yep. Your time starts now. All right. I am with the EMC TV. We are the corporate television arm and the marketing department of EMC Corporation, uh, based in Boston, outside of Boston. Uh, EMC is a, uh, an IT company, uh, along with the rest of my colleagues here, uh, one of the largest IT companies in the world. Um, I like to say uh, what we do at EMC TV is on the cutting edge of corporate television. But we do have a problem, and that problem is around our video streaming. And I, what I like to say is uh, we play a little video streaming platform roulette. Let me tell you what that means. Um, let's take, for example, a, uh, a company-wide town hall here. So EMC TV, we produce the broadcast. We produce all the live broadcasts, internal and external at EMC. Our IT department, EMC IT, handles the multicast, so the internal streaming of that across the EMC network. They use a Windows Media Server for that. Pretty bare bones uh, display, just the video. They do a great job with that. To handle people that aren't in the office, though, we engage with Livestream, and Livestream helps us reach the whole of our organizations, so all EMC employees. So between the multicast on the EMC network, Live stream for people working outside the network, working remote, working from home, we're able to hit everybody, which is fine. Great user experience there. Let's take, for example, our EMC World User Conference. Now that's owned by EMC.com, and they do a takeover of the homepage when we do our user conference. They bring in a streaming, vending, uh, a vendor, streaming vendor to, uh, to help out with that. So a totally different user experience from our internal broadcast but uh, they do a great job as well, but a different user experience there as well. Next up is our sales kickoff. We do a virtual sales kickoff event for EMC sales as well as our partner community sales, and that's handled by our EMC Education Services Group. Now, they use their own platform for video streaming that for internal as well as the partner community. Different user experience as well. And next up uh, are product launches, global product launches. We do a lot of these throughout the year. Again, we do the broadcast. That's owned by our events group. 
and our events group engages yet with yet another um, streaming vendor to push out the, the broadcast for those. So what you end up with is very inconsistent user experience across the board for those. So as Sora mentioned, uh, we conducted an informal survey here of our panelists leading into the panel just to find out what uh, we will, we're looking for in terms of different areas of, of streaming. Um, I have the user experience uh, area to talk about. Um, so first up, a responsive video player. So all of us found that responsive video player that today extremely important. Um, obviously, we have people watching on mobile devices, on um, laptops, on any, any other kind of devices, uh, smartphones. So we need a, a player that will scale along with, those, uh, with our viewers. Uh, adaptive streaming as well. So we never know whether our viewers are watching from home office or a large office or uh, working from, uh, you know, from a partner community. So um, we need the streaming to provide a, a consistent uh, a viewership across. And we never know what kind of bit rate they're going to have uh, in terms of their, their bandwidth. Sharing, very important, you know, to extend the message either inside to fellow, fellow employees or extending it uh, outside to, to help out with, with marketing uh, projects. So sharing is, is very important, obviously. Uh, language selection, this is an interesting one. Uh, I think we're at different stages of rolling this out, both internally and externally. Obviously, all of us are with global companies, and we have uh, uh, global customers as well. So I think this will be 100% uh, probably by the end of next year. Um, and the last two we'll take together here, rating and commenting. Uh, we're kind of on the fence on this one, and, and my guess is that you, know, you really kind of lose control over your messaging and uh, over your branding here. So it can be a little tricky uh, with the rating and commenting unless you're, you're right on top of it. So at EMC, we've experienced an overwhelming demand in the past year for two areas. Uh, first I'm going to talk about is chat. Um, our executives love chat. This is the favorite feature our executives have uh, of any of our streaming at, uh, at EMC for any of our things. Why? Because it really connects the global employees. So when they're able to look out and see their global communities, whether it's a particular business unit or as a company as a whole, and see the, the whole global community um, you know, responding to, to their messages, uh, it's something that's really a key takeaway for them. And it transforms a monologue into a dialogue. So it really fosters two-way communication instead of just uh, speaking to your employees, you're actually getting some feedback as, as you're speaking. How are we doing on time? OK, thank you. And it inspires organic collaboration. We've seen many times where in the chat window, people have their questions answered. Um, while a live broadcast is going. Our challenge right now, at least internally, is that uh, we use live stream for our chat, uh, which has been terrific for us, but uh, the multicast doesn't offer that. So a lot of the, the viewership internally has no uh, chat functionality whatsoever. Um, and on top of that, uh, Q&A. q and a is, uh, is a huge thing for us. Everybody asks for Q&A as part of their live broadcast. So, in terms of a small broadcast or internal, external, everybody, everybody asks for that. So right now we use uh, either email box for more sensitive broadcasts or even Twitter for some more open broadcasts to try to generate some Q&A for our, for our broadcasts. Um, but we do have exciting uh, news, at least internally here, where we have some live two-way HD video coming next year for select events. So uh, this is a project we've been working on, uh, proof of concept with a couple of different vendors. And uh, we're looking forward to rolling that out across the company, both for internal and external events next year. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Lewis. Close. All right. So um, the straw that I picked on the panel is really to talk about reporting. And um, to do that, I want to give you a bit of a uh, bit of a uh, background on on my role in my organization and the group. So, I'm in the My Microsoft Existence Experiences organization. So we're we report down from Chi Lu in ASG, and we're within Office. Um, in in our org, we do all of the UI strings. Uh, all of the um, content associated with the office services and applications. So that would be all of the articles you would find on uh, support.office.com. So you hit F1 and you're searching for an article, some kind of help article, that's us. 
We do the first run experiences for some of the apps, so on the phone, apps on the phone. At load, you might see some kind of learning uh, uh, animations, we create those, uh, and all of the training. Uh, the organization is comprised of PM, software engineers, and content. So within the content team, we're creating all this content. Uh, I'm kind of, you know, my role is kind of creative, both within the, the videos themselves, and then a deep partnership with the engineering team over uh, distribution, so driving requirements in for the player, uh, driving requirements in for telemetry, and then pulling all that stuff together so that we have data to help us make great videos. So we care about distribution. Uh, we care about the player a great deal. We just um, went live a couple weeks ago with an HTML5 player that's uh, live streaming with uh, f you know, you know, failover to Flash and Silverlight. Uh, we're on Azure Media Services, Akamai's our back end, it's global. Um, and to give you an idea of the scale, we have about 2,000 articles with videos um, that are just US English, and they get about 1.2 million page views a month. Uh, we exist to improve cu customer satisfaction. Like that's our primary purpose. We're, we partner deeply with the product teams to improve the overall experience for the customers, and part of that is serving up content. So reporting is a huge part of that, and we're, we're just now in a position where we're bringing both player telemetry and article data together so that we have this really rich view uh, into, into the data. And part of that, you know, you put it in a cube, you hook it up to Excel and you start doing all these pivots. We have scorecards that report up to leadership, but the real uh, exciting and, and you know, great opportunity is drilling down into content sets and actually trying to uh, understand why they're performing great or what needs improvement. So this is, just the, you know, this is just a piece of some of the things that we collect, both from the page views and the player telemetry. And I think it's amazing, like, you know, we, we, we create software for, um, you know, OS X, for iOS, for Android, for Windows. So we really want to understand where our customers are consuming our, our uh, using our applications and consuming our content, what that, that experience is. So this is kind of at the macro level. And we, but we've also spent a lot of time digging down into what customers find useful about our content. So if you imagine like a heat map on a homepage, you really want to know where customers are looking and what they're clicking on and what that behavior is and how to optimize it. But in video, that pretty much gets lost. Most organizations see the video as just this unit and they're going to measure the performance of that unit. Um, we partnered with Comscore to come up with a way we can do uh, essentially focus groups to put videos in front of them, and in real time, as the participants are watching the video, they're rating it moment by moment. And we get averages, uh, the, the dark line is kind of the overall average for that video, but then you can drill down and see, see those, um, those lines by uh, demographic, by profession, which is important, because we have IT Pro, we've got um, IW audiences, We've got admin, we've got uh, information workers. So we bring all those people into the focus group, put this in front of them, they watch the video, and we get this kind of you know, micro view into how the video is going to report. So between everything that we can collect from the player, everything that we can uh, get from the article, and this kind of insight into the video itself, we get this, this very powerful I think, way to, to uh, come up with content strategies that really drive to our customer goals, one minute. Um, the, uh, oh, I didn't realize this build. So a part of all of that is how do, we, how do we bring consistency to video creation? So we've got this great data story. And this is really the end, end result, is a style guide and an approach to video production that puts the customer's intent, what they're after first, uh, within the video, 
And then uh, we provide a context. So customers like, I need to do X. We hit that right off the top. Give them that information up front. We don't have any introductions. No, in this video I'm going to show you. It's like, boom, here's what you need to know. Here's the context for it. We go into the procedure. And then if there's some uh, kind of little value add that we can add at the end of the video that's kind of that moment of like, oh my god, I didn't know you could do that. I'm so glad to know that. We want to bring that in, into the video as well. So we have a lot of data. <laughs> um, it's easier to use uh, to a certain degree. Uh, even in the last, I would say, three years, I've been in, at Microsoft 14 years. I've been in this org seven. Um, the last two or three years, it's been a real uh, wholesale change in how far down we can drill. And we have a BI team that does a lot of the heavy lifting, but I spend a huge amount of time in Excel uh, mining the data, creating all kinds of pivots, trying to get really, really specific about what it is that, that we need to do. Um, we used to just have page views, and that's great to know, but it doesn't really, uh, it's not the most powerful tool in the toolkit with all that stuff. So understanding all of these things um, is super helpful. But like with, any, like with anything, we have all this data, we have all this insight, there's a million things we could do to improve our content set. And then it gets into the, you know, back to prioritization and resourcing. We have finite resources. Uh, we're always time constrained. We're releasing uh, on a monthly cadence now. So, um, you know, that's, that's always the challenge. Happy to have the data, um, always struggling to make excellent use of it. Hi there. I really like that last comment. Nice to have the data, critical pieces, and how you use it. So um, I'm David Boyle. I work with Oracle. Um, I've been with Oracle for seven years. Uh, my team, uh, well, you know what? I'll wait till the end, like you said. <laughs> so extensibility, what does that mean? Well, um, yeah, you have a video platform. You've got the core functionality to deliver live and on-demand video, but what are you gonna, how are you going to connect it up with the other things that make it secure, uh, create data feeds, uh, create potentially um, uh, different data to be uh, injected into the content, such as captions and subtitling. And uh, let's say you want to measure it. You probably need some metrics. And then you probably want to store it. Uh, once it's, uh, you know, once it's ready for on-demand, you probably want to manage that stuff that you've stored. You probably want to track your metadata, the descriptive data about the, uh, the video content that you're creating. And then, of course, the, the metrics and measurement is huge in business intelligence. So, so I've asked a few questions here. I'm just going to kind of expose them. Um, critical services challenges for extensibility. Um, we rely intensively on our solution providers and partners out uh, in, the, in the supplier ecosystem, both for live streaming, for video on demand, for content delivery, metrics, and all of the features and functionality that I've mentioned. Uh, very little of what we, of what we uh, the technology that we uh, deploy is, at least on the user facing side and the software functional side, is Oracle. Everything we use on the storage side is Oracle. Everything we use on the BI side is Oracle. Um, but in terms of our ability to keep up with uh, the latest and greatest, we would be prevented from being agile if we weren't able to be extensible and connect the various best practices in the industry together to provide an industry leading solution, which I think we do provide. As an example, our Recent Oracle Open World, uh, the world's largest uh, business and tech conference. Uh, in one week, we edited and published 111 videos and had 17 hours of live streaming. And from now on, I'm just going to call it broadcasting, because that's what it is. I think the word streaming needs to be replaced by broadcasting, because really what it is is broadcasting over the internet. So pet peeve. We'll talk at the beer thing later about that. Um, so challenges, you see them. Uh, we're not API experts. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of this ourselves, right? We're going to be building APIs to connect internal databases to our, potentially to our 
internal databases and functional platforms. We're going to be doing it cloud to cloud. Um, the primary platforms that we use to deliver and manage and uh, uh, publish and measure content are cloud-based now. So how do you connect those clouds together? Um, we need to look at new internal capabilities and upskilling and training. And uh, we have one developer on our team. He's a JavaScript developer. Now he's got a, we want him to learn how to write APIs. We don't want one-offs. We want systematic, a systematic approach to integration that's standards-based and that's open. Uh, what are the challenges I don't have anymore? Well, management knows it's important now uh, because in large measure I tell them at every opportunity. Um, so yeah, you, you, you see this uh, pivotal and extensibility. Who's going to do it? I just mentioned moving skill sets and roles in house. Burden for development shifts to the customer. So uh, when something breaks, I choke my own throat. That was an IT joke. Get it? <laughs> So, um, most ex important change in extensibility, just the, migra the, the evolution of the technology and how it's deployed and implemented from, I'll just take file delivery as a very basic uh, a task that we need to do. FTP needs to be secure, SFTP, SFTP. Well, um, it needs to be two-way. Uh, it needs to be automated, APIs. We have another thing that we're using now that's uh, uh, manage file transfer over UDP, which is amazing, and I love that. Um, and you can see the other changes that I've provided. I have 37 seconds left, so I'm gonna get right to it. Um, here is the tasks that we had at hand uh, for Open World. You see our timelines for publishing our live to video on demand. We could not have met these aggressive timelines if it were not for, in, for extensive integrations between platforms. Um, here's a, uh, a very generic diagram, a system diagram of our uh, publishing workflow. Um, you see the internal platforms below the line, external platforms above the line with the various protocols. I can show you this in more detail if you like. That's what it looks like today. That's what it looks like tomorrow with two additional partners left in, added into the mix. And that's what it looks like next year with all these internal databases that we need to connect and we don't know how. And that is my time. If you could just end, David, by, uh, I think Lewis did actually a really good job. Could you end by telling us what do you do? Oh, um, I manage a team of technologists, um, developer, uh, project managers, and program managers to support uh, media creation, publishing, management, uh, and distribution for all of our brand creative organization and corporate marketing, so photography and icons and logos and video. Thank you. And Dave, could you tell us, just for a quick reminder, what do you do at EMC? Uh, senior manager, EMC TV, in-house uh, corporate television department for the marketing department in EMC. Okay. I think, I think we got it, Lewis. It was a good introduction she gave us. <laughs> one more time. One more time. <laughs> no, no, you're well, out of time. Well, actually, I mean, it, it, I will have one, you know, say one thing. As of yesterday, my title changed to managing editor. But what we really are pushing for in terms of roles is content strategists. Right. So that's really what that is. Yeah, and, and, and um, if you get a chance, you should understand Lewis's, uh, the way they're organized. It is truly progressive for a company their size, the way they've brought their development and content teams together for one customer experience, really. Um, okay, so we're going to switch now to the uh, question and answer session. You might be wondering why I'm down here when I got kind of tired sitting up there, but also because I really want to encourage people to ask questions, and I'm going to try to capture your questions on this mic. So who would like to go first? There is a bonus if you go first. Oh, here we go. Hi, my, <clears throat> hello, uh, my name is Eric. Uh, this is for Dave. Um, so you had mentioned uh, chat as being something that's being used pretty regularly. Yes. What kind of limitations have you experienced with chat, security, kind of approval processes, things of that nature? Yep, so good question. Um, in terms of chat, like I mentioned, we use the live stream platform. Um, so that's for our internal events. So uh, the, in terms of security, we're working towards a single sign-on for that. Uh, but right now, it's just password protection uh, for our chat. Um, so it's just EMC, customer, uh, EMC customers, partners, and uh, employees right now on the chat windows. Um, the vendor, uh, contracted vendors we use for some of our larger events, you know, have their own virtual experience uh, windows with chat. But the things we're doing internally now, it's just live stream. And just to follow up on that, and you haven't had any major issues with your current chat solution? That is correct. Okay. 
That's the official word. Next question. Oh, good. Now I'm running. Hi, uh, Dustin. This is kind of for for everybody. Um, with the the ecosystem, you know, really ends at that user interface um, being the web portal, if you will. The a lot of the players these days that are consumer based, you know, they do give you the stats for nerds like a YouTube or the UStreams as well. Um, do you guys own that portal as a whole for your users, and you just insert your Q&A module into that, like a yes, no, if a certain user wants it or a certain organization wants it? Or do you rely and push them to that, or do they request those features from you? I'll give that to Lewis first, <laughs> if you understood the entire question. Uh, I'm kind of. I mean, with, with the content that we create, chat's not a, really a part of that at this point. Uh, on support.office.com, there might be support chat, but not, not within streaming. Skype has that. But I, I'm. Dave, you want to take that one? Sure. Yeah. So um, in our, our experience, it's more us providing that to the end user, to the business unit. It's something that they request um, constantly. Um, that's a big part of, uh, of every event that we do in terms of the Q&A. Um, so we support them in that. They usually supply, uh, supply a subject matter expert uh, for the Q&A, um, whatever that's involved. But uh, it is something that we get requests for you know, constantly. And if I could actually answer, Dustin, because I do this too, just saying. Um, we actually at Cisco have three layers that support that activity. There's whoever's doing the actual uh, activity or, or event or, or broadcast. There's the internal, similar to Dave, uh, Cisco TV team that has best practices around engagement. And our team actually specializes in just that. So we'll go the next step in actually designing the content for interactivity. All three are trying to drive that result. But if it fails horribly, it's mostly just the primary team that gets in trouble. Okay? All right. Come over here. Thanks. Uh, to what extent is, uh, are your productions multicam productions? Mr. Boyle, would you like to take that one? Sure. From an event and live broadcast perspective, all of them. From a uh, pure VOD perspective, Mm, Multicam is probably 20%, 80% single cam film style. I'd say for us almost never. Yeah, because you, you have a, a stronger narrative uh, scripted uh, yeah. model though. Dave? Yeah. yeah, my team you know specifically does the live broadcast for EMC, so 100%. Um, we're, we're lucky to have uh, several studios uh, around the world. Um, and we can do from our home studio in Massachusetts, we probably do six camera shoots on a regular basis. I'm complete with jib, uh, you know, steady cam, everything. Uh, and then we take that on the road with us when we, when we travel to different shows, so. And now he's just showing off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, I'll come back to the back. I'm uh, just uh, curious about um, engagement. Are you guys doing anything to measure engagement while the content is being streamed out, like quizzes or? kind of polling and those kind of things? Um, we, have a, we have a ratings uh, for the page that the video is on. And, uh, we've been, and so that's kind of our primary measure of satisfaction for that, for that page. So we care about the unit, not just the video, but that whole experience. And then, and then we can look at, um, and then, and then there's like math, you know, there has to be a certain number of, of, of ratings and, you know, there's magic math that happens. And then um, comments, and there, there's, you know, we're looking at ways to kind of tease out more information about the comments, like now you, you have to go look at them, but they're unbelievably rich source of information. And then with the, with the data that we're gathering, you know, percent viewed, uh, and then session data, on how did they come into that page and where did they go? Are we actively solving their, you know, their issue? So that's kind of the way we, we think about it. David, did you have anything different on how you're doing engagement? I would say 
to the extent that, oh, so for live, we do a fair bit of Q&A. So we'll collect questions for the speakers uh, via a web form. And then for VOD, um, we're firm believers in uh, attaching a call to action to pretty much everything that we produce. And that's part of the content strategy up front with the, with the requester, internal, internal client, is to tie, tie their, uh, their production back to a marketing or other objective. And then a, a CTA is the most obvious direct way to uh, implore the user to action. Uh, and then we can use uh, responses to the CTA as a proxy for engagement. Any difference, Dave, or is that pretty much spot no, on? I agree with that. A chat and Q&A are really how we, we uh, you know, figure out who's, who's watching and if they're, they're paying attention. And if there was a topic that I would have spoke on, that was it. The next six months, you're going to see a lot of things coming out of Cisco as far as real-time video engagement options. And I, I predict there'll be at least three sessions at this conference next year just about real-time engagement in video player experiences. That's my personal prediction. I'm going to run to the back. Go, Saurabh, go. 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 Moderate. Thank you. Uh, I work for a, a major nonprofit healthcare organization in Utah. It covers most of the state of Utah, and I am uh, kind of desperately trying to, to find out how to convince the powers to be to, to do more with internal video broadcasting, um, not just within our employees, but also potentially to our customers, ultimately the patients. What are some do's and don'ts or kind of a path to quick convincing the, all the managers and executives thereof to, to actually invest some money instead of just kind of skimping by? So Mr. Boyle, if you want to take that first, and then Dave, if you want to take yeah, it after. But I'll just be very David quick. said that he's actually figured this out. So. I'll just, yeah, actually I have. It's very simple. It works. It's effective. It's measurable. Uh, it's instantaneous. It's engaging. Um, I used to say that uh, if a picture's worth a thousand words and a second of video is worth 30,000 words because each frame in a second and then what's an hour of video worth, um, I'm happy to talk with you after about that. How do I follow that? Yeah. <laughs> That's a great answer. That's a great answer. Uh, we've been lucky enough to have buy-in at the executive level. You know, we've had a CMO came into our company about five years ago that really believed in television and he was able to sponsor us. Um, but uh, I agree with David that uh, you know the proof is in the pudding, right? If if you're able to reach all of these people uh, immediately, whether it's live or uh, you know if, if they're watching on demand, um, you know that that's your answer right there. It's, it's showing showing the reach, you know. Well, I I think leadership, you know, they they want to see the the ROI, and there there are a couple of I think perception issues that I that I you know consistently run up against, and one is that video is expensive. Uh, just up front, so there's, you know, sh showing the math that, you know, kind of demonstrates what the actual true costs are, mm -hmm. but also the the per unit cost can be really low mm -hmm. if you really fine tune your production mm -hmm. stuff. So it's it, it cost shouldn't be the primary factor relative to other forms of content creation. So the other one is, is attaching that to, to to metrics that matter to leadership. Like what is it they, they really, really care about in terms of driving the business? And how's video having an impact uh, on, on those KPIs? And when you can't do that, which is often the case right at the beginning, two things executives really feed off of, pride and fear. <laughs> Find your number one competitor in your location that's using video and go look at their metrics, right? And then find a vendor or a company that you aspire to be like. Use their own examples. Go find how they're using video. Both of those companies are using video. Oh, I'm back here. Hi, my name's Charlie, and uh, I want to ask some questions about um, the users that you have. Um, what percentage of them are coming in from mobile devices, and how do you handle you know, video to mobile devices, especially for internal only? the security around that, and then maybe um, a little bit on you know, bringing your own devices. Um, David, you seem like you want to answer this one. <laughs> I do. Uh, so for external, non-secure uh, live event broadcasting, uh, we do a really great job because we prioritize user experience on mobile. We strip it down to just exactly what the mobile user needs. 
Uh, we make sure that it's optimized for their device, for their connection method. Um, you mentioned internal live broadcast to mobile devices. This is tricky. Uh, if there's any caching on the device, security's gonna say no. Uh, if it saturates local Wi-Fi, uh, IT's gonna say maybe not. We don't wanna spend the money. But uh, we actually are currently in development. I think our release is, uh, is planned for first quarter of FY17, which will be June of FY16, uh, June of calendar 16, for a secure live internal broadcast on our internal video platform. So we've nailed it internally, and we're deploying in June. Yeah, Lewis, I have to assume yeah, a lot of your audience. We're uh, mobile first. Uh, so it's, it works from both ends. One, it's, it's from, for distribution, adaptive player, um, making sure that there, it, everything is performant on mobile devices. But the other side that I think people miss a lot is that we design our videos for, for small screens, right? And there's a ton of design considerations that go into making sure that it's useful on a mobile device. So for example, if you're doing a product you know, demo of a UI, you can't just do a full-size screen capture demo and stick it on this and expect people to be able to read the, the UI text. So it changed everything that, all the ways that we, we go about producing video. And those two things together, it's a great mobile experience. And, and the model for that has been set by film and television. Film and television now is geared to mobile screens. So you can see the way that cameras are being used and the way that even scripting has changed to get closer in and then to intentionally take you out. And it's a much longer topic to discuss, but I think the model is there and many of us, I think, are catching up now. Okay. I'll come back to you. Uh, considering uh, how the OVPs have evolved today, so do we think at this time all security concerns in terms of placing the IP content on, on the cloud has been addressed and, and we are going to the next level? So I don't want to set a pattern, but I know Mr. Boyle wants to answer. Yeah, yeah so to take, to take uh, a, a page out of Larry Ellison's playbook, you can do security, why don't you turn it on? Uh, essentially what he's saying is security for, for proprietary internal content is table stakes. And if you are securing content by obscuring it, they don't have the URL, they'll, therefore they'll never find it. You better look for another job. I'll just be very <laughs> clear about that. So in, in, in the area of delivering secure live internal content, we do uh, encryption over the public internet, we do encryption at rest, we do player verification, and we do token authentication. Four-way security. Because our intellectual property is our business, and if you're not taking that seriously, find a job doing something else. And I'm gonna contrast that by Dave, where you are right now. So right. you have multiple providers at various levels of security. Indeed. How often does this come up? Uh, quite a bit. And that's something that our, our internal IT department is working towards, you know, having uh, some kind of single sign-on, um, you know, for, for this around the security. Uh, that's a great question, and you have me frightened now, David. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk. That, that going we'll back. Talk. Yeah, we should talk. Yeah. We should talk about this. But, um, no, security is definitely an issue. Um, some of our groups uh, demand it, and uh, some don't really seem to care, but uh, it's something that needs to be addressed. Yeah, the, the security investment, at least, is I think David laid it out very articulately. On our perspective, it's the 1% of the investment that makes the other 99% worthwhile. When you get hit, you realize, wow, it didn't actually cost that much. Now it does. Yeah, and if you're, if you're hit once, try doing it again with the same amount of scrutiny you had before and same amount of trust yeah, internally. Not happening. Yeah. No, no, no. Volume gets turned way up, and so does the heat. So I noticed this penciled in on David's chart about the future is digital asset management. Um, I'm actually curious about how you're dealing with the thousands, if not tens of thousands of content of hours that we're producing, how you're managing it, how you're retiring it, how you're repurposing it. 
Um, and obviously we get simple tools like search and finding it, but uh, is there any strategy that's going on in any of your companies as far as managing those assets which are producing so relevantly? <laughs> yes, there is strategy. <laughs> <laughs> so the good news is, is DAM is one thing that we have, and it works great. It's connecting that DAM platform to the other platforms that it needs to service and deliver and be the single source of truth to provide recourse to those approved current assets. So you talked about retirement. What we need to do is create uh, business rules within that asset management platform uh, that can uh, intelligently make those retention decisions for us based on the criteria we define in terms of what our business priorities are. Um, uh, and in terms of uh, managing uh, the, the assets and reusing, providing recourse so those assets can be reused, yes, we provide uh, access and search capability within the dam for produced assets, but one of our initiatives that we're building right now in, in, the, you know, in the lab with the elves hammering away with hammers and stuff is, uh, is a, a connected MAM platform to house all of the um, uh, metadata about raw assets. So, for example, uh, I watched your video last week, and there's this great shot of a guy working behind a computer. We need that shot, right? Well, the, the version they're going to see is, is a mezzanine file at most. It's not the, the highest resolution, although it's great. It's got a graphic overlay. How do we get that user, that requester, that original clip to use in that video they want to produce tomorrow? That's our, that's our latest mm -hmm. challenge. And Lewis, I have to assume you're in the middle of this. Yeah, we, um, we have a, a video content management system that's its own universe. And so for our, our customers, you know, our internal customers, uh, there's a process for requesting videos. From, from the very beginning, they're putting data into the system that's attached to that video. So in the VCMS, creates essentially work items in, in our work management system. So we know, we, we know a lot about where, where our stuff is, and it's all on a NAS, and we have the archived files, we've got the source files, we have the project files, we, we do pretty much everything in After Effects uh, or Premiere Pro. It automatically creates our captions, and this is really key for a number of reasons. One of the biggest is that's our handoff to Loke. And we look, you know, we look to like 40 languages, you know, thousands of iterations of those files. Um, so it's really robust. We, we can put like a, a start date and a kill date to a video. We're, we're getting more and more uh, thoughtful about just like the, the health of our catalog. Because we don't want old stuff cluttering up the, the SEO universe, right? We want to be very crisp about that. So it's actually really robust and it's all internal. It's all internal tools that we've made. I, I'm allowed one bad pun per session. That's kind of how it works. So keep that in mind for the next couple of days. And so here's mine, is that what we have is that we have a lot of dams holding a lot of data lakes. That's I, our problem. In terms of uh, more information on this, there's a great article um, uh, in this month's Streaming Media mag magazine called, uh, what is it, Pam, Dam, Ma'am, and Thank You, Ma'am. Yeah, it's something like that. Yeah, yeah. check, check it, it out. With thank You, Ma'am, though. Very yeah. informative article. All right, I think we can take one more question. Oh, oh, of course. I, I missed your follow-up, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, hi. <clears throat> Excuse me, my name is Peter Crosby. And um, you were mentioning, um, Lewis, you were talking about uh, 40 languages. And I'd love to understand how do you guys uh, measure the value of adding translations to your video? Uh, is mm. it, how do you demonstrate it to executives? How do you um, uh, get it done in a way that's economical? And do you do it only in Redmond? Or do you do it around no, the world? No, it's a huge, huge organization. Um, and I don't know that I can speak to your entire question. Um, Loke, Loke looks at our data Right, and, and in terms of prioritization, um, they're looking at the same things that we're looking at about what are our primary initiatives. Like what are the things we care about most in terms of reaching our customers? So for example, you know, uh, Office 16, big deal. We're gonna support that. Loke divides the world into tiers. So there's tier one, two, and three countries. 
depending on what it is and how important it is, they might uh, localize it into all those languages, or they might choose to do just some languages with a full localization pack where they might, you know, if, you know, where they have to capture the UI, right, in, in that language, or that it's a, it's a, you know, left to right language, or right to left language, or something like that. And then sometimes, uh, depending on what it is, they'll caption the CC file into multiple languages, so regions can choose that. So it's, it kind of depends, but because we're global, and because it's absolutely necessary to reach out to the, to the world with our content, um, LOC is a huge and important part of that. And the challenges there, in terms of budget, are significant as well. But we worked with them uh, for a long time especially in the video space, to really bring those costs down. And we, we like cut it in half simply by how we manage the project files, right? And, and, it, and it's, and it, you know, like we're putting markers at, at any time the UI changes or anything changes in that After Effects file, they can pick that up, pull that frame out, localize the frame, drop it back in, stretch it, and it just absolutely uh, reduces the turnaround time and vendor cost and all that stuff. So, did either the David want to add to that? We're we're out of time, but no, I, I'm not sure you could do better. Just candidly, <laughs> <laughs> he's really good at that. Um, okay, well then the last thing we have is a question to all of you, for which you'll need to use your right hand. If you could just let us know perfectly honestly, if this was helpful, if this was not helpful, or yeah. Okay, that's a pretty honest audience. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you all very much. And thank you guys.